What is up, my fellow light lover? I'm Tyler Tripo, an owner-operator gaffer with a one-ton grip and electric package based out of Denver, Colorado. This video is going to be a very detailed look at the Aperture Storm 1000C. First, we'll review all the new features on the 1000C, including Aperture's new Blair GC chipset, and how these features combine to make this light such a big deal. Then, I'll cover the things that I like about the 1000C, and where I think it could be improved. After that, it's color science time, where we reach depths of nerdiness that OceanGate could only dream about. Everybody hates long intros, and this video is definitely long enough, so let's jump right into why the Aperture Storm 1000C has me so excited. The Aperture Storm 1000C is a 1300 watt light featuring Aperture's new Blair GC LED chipset design. This chipset doesn't just enable an extended CCT range from 1800 Kelvin to 20,000 Kelvin and cover 90% of the REC 2020 color space, it also introduces an entirely new concept in LED lighting, and I'll talk more about why this new LED design is the new standard for filmmaking a little later on. Aperture also claims they've beefed up the low-level dimming on the 1000C compared to previous generations. Not only will the light dim linearly from 100% intensity all the way down to 0.1% intensity, but it'll also remain color accurate throughout the entire intensity range. And don't worry, it definitely tested this as well, and we'll be taking a look at the results further on. As for the available lighting modes, the 1000C has the usual CCT mode, an all new HSIC Plus mode, a gel library, RGB and XY modes, and a selection of effects. On the hardware side, the head unit and ballast are both IP65 rated, meaning the 1000C can be placed outdoors when it's pouring, snowing, whatever, and we don't have to worry about it getting wrecked. The head unit also features Aperture's new ProLock locking Bowens mount design, and there's threaded holes on the side as another mounting option. Connectivity options include CRMX, DMX512 in and out, SACN, and ArtNet over EtherCon, as well as Sidus. As far as accessories, the head of the 1000C features mounting locations on these bottom pegs for a skid plate. When connected, this skid plate will lift the head off the ground enough that the new CF12 for now can stay attached during storage. The lamp will also have enough room underneath for the header cable to rest, meaning that the 1000C can be stored all ready to go on a shelf. The 1000C menu also has some nifty new options. There's a high-speed flicker mode that enables flicker-free shooting at any frame rate. There's an option for fan control via DMX. And inside the product info screen, there's an operating status selection that gives info on lamp hours, temperatures, and error logs. But my favorite new feature and the one that hints the most at the amount of color science and the software of this light has to be the ability to select between the two white light standards, black body or CIE daylight. The tricky thing about white is that the same white doesn't always appear white depending on the environment. So to determine what a light's white point target even should be, what white light even is, had to be defined first. And in order to do that, scientists came up with a concept called color temperature. There are currently two standards used to define color temperature, black body and CIE daylight. To physicists, a black body is an object that outputs color in direct relation to its temperature. As the amount of heat increases, the light radiated by a black body goes from a very warm orange color at the lower end of the temperature spectrum moving towards white, and then finishing at a bluish tone at the upper end. These colors can be quantified, and when the resulting temperature versus output line is graphed in the CIE 1976 uniform color space, we end up with a curve that looks like this. This black body curve has long been the standard for how color temperature has been defined, and is also referred to as the Planckian curve when viewed in a color space like this. The second standard color temperature curve is known as CIE daylight. It's called daylight because it's based on measurements of real daylight. And it's prefaced with CIE because way back forever ago, all the way in 1964, 
Standard illuminants of D50, D55, and D65 were created by the same CIE organization that created the CIE 1931 color space, which I think we've all seen before. Based off these standard outputs, a formula was derived to calculate the spectral output of an idealized sun anywhere on a scale from 4,000 Kelvin to 25,000 Kelvin. Corresponding CCT values can be derived from the spectral outputs, and again, we can plot this in a color space to get a color temperature curve. But when we plot these two standards on the same graph, we can see that they don't actually overlap. The Planckian curve is slightly below the CIE daylight curve. To resolve this difference, a third standard has been introduced recently, the TM30 reference standard. This standard progressively blends between the black body and CIE daylight curves between 4000 and 5000 Kelvin. So when you're digging around in the menu of the Storm 1000C and you come upon the white light standard option, this is what it's referring to. Black body will follow the older Planckian curve standard throughout the entire color temperature range, while CIE daylight follows black body below 4000 Kelvin, transitions from black body at 4000 Kelvin to CIE daylight at 5000 Kelvin, and then continues to follow CIE daylight standard for the rest of the CCT range. Now, why does any of this color temperature stuff even matter? First, pretty much every older LED light was manufactured to match the black body standard, which means the Storm 1000C will be backwards compatible with any of your existing older fixtures. But way more importantly, modern cameras have already been calibrated to CIE daylight for years now. So pretty much any camera you film with is expecting a scene above 5000 Kelvin to be illuminated by a daylight standard, complete with the full spectrum that the sunlight outputs. Therefore, any light tracking the Planckian curve will appear magenta shifted to the camera sensor and require color correction in post to get it to look right. And I'll touch more upon what I mean by full spectrum in the next section. To understand why the new Blair GC chipset that Aperture has designed is such a huge leap forward, we need to detour into how LED lights work and how they've evolved over the last few years. LED lights utilize a concept referred to as the energy band gap to emit the photons that we detect as light. An energy band gap refers to the measurable amount of energy that's required for an electron to jump from the valence band to the conduction band of a given solid material. The wavelength of the associated photon that gets emitted once this energy threshold has been reached is directly related to the amount of energy that's required to cross the band gap. A higher band gap energy level is associated with a shorter wavelength or a shift towards red. Furthermore, the energy required to cross the electron band gap is also directly related to the chemical makeup of the diode in a light emitting diode. So by changing the chemical structure of the diode and therefore changing the energy that's required for the electrons to transition between energy states within that material, manufacturers are able to create LEDs that emit at different wavelengths. And to create LEDs with wider wavelength distributions, like with the goal of obtaining a spectral output that's similar to daylight, manufacturers will apply special coatings to them. In fact, the cool white LEDs found on daylight units are usually just blue LEDs coated with a substance known as a phosphor, which is a fancy name for a substance that fluoresces when exposed to visible light. These phosphor coatings, which can be comprised of anywhere between one to three types of phosphors, will absorb the higher energy blue wavelength emitted from the LED and then re-emit that energy at wavelengths longer than blue, primarily between green and red. In doing so, they broaden the spectral output of the LED that they're coating. And to get warm white LEDs and thereby create bicolor lights, manufacturers just apply the same phosphor coatings as with cool white LEDs but in different amounts and ratios. But 
there's one big issue with using just warm and cool white diodes to control for color temperature, and it's that there isn't a second axis of control, that being green magenta. If we refer back to our white light standard graphs, we can see that they are curved. And as a result, a bicolor light can only ever be color temperature accurate at two points and shifts magenta between those or green beyond them. To resolve this issue, manufacturers introduced RGB WW lights that enabled this second access of control between green and magenta, which gave us even more color accurate LED lights. But utilizing these phosphor coatings can only get us so close to replicating the output of the sun, no matter how good the SSI score is, because they're missing part of the spectrum that the sun excites. Phosphor coated LEDs aren't able to target this near ultraviolet portion of the visible light spectrum. This higher energy portion, while not very detectable to the naked eye, is what's responsible for why natural sunlight looks so good to us. Because being excited by this wavelength is what causes objects to fluoresce, and quite a lot of everyday objects fluoresce. This is where the new Blair GC chipset developed by Aperture for the Storm 1000C is such a huge leap forward. The chipset contains an indigo emitter that targets this portion of the near UV spectrum. Being excited by this wavelength causes objects to fluoresce just as if they were lit by the sun, which is also the je ne sais quoi of HMIs that everybody still gushes over. And this fluorescence effect isn't something that we can currently measure with any current lighting standards like SSI or TM30 either, but it is detectable by both our eyes and our cameras. This white t-shirt is a good example of fluorescence working in action. Most laundry detergents contain compounds that enhance fluorescence, taking in energy at the near UV level and shifting it into a blue wavelength. In the sunlight, the shirt looks white, and the shirt also looks white when lit by the Storm 1000C because of the indigo emitter. But these fluorescent near UV wavelengths aren't excited by traditional white LEDs, leaving my crisp new white tee feeling kind of yellow and dirty looking in the bottom panel. But it's not just white t-shirts that fluoresce, people's skin and eyes do as well, and everyday objects too, like dyes and printed materials meaning this light helps with color accuracy in any style of production, not just narrative or interview setups. And filming in both daylight and artificial light on the same set happens pretty frequently. It's pretty often that I'm gonna be working a gig where we're filming some B-roll of our talent outside in the sun, and then we're gonna roll our A-roll interview inside. The fluorescence caused by the Blair GC chipset on the Aperture Storm 1000C reduces time spent color grading in post because now the colors match in frame regardless of whether we're shooting exteriors, interiors, or both. Another benefit of this chipset is that there isn't the traditional 50% cut in output that comes from a bicolor light. In fact, because all seven diodes are used to create white light, the Storm 1000C is actually brighter than the 1200D, and I'll bring the receipts in a bit here. Now that we've covered why the new Blair GC chipset is such a huge leap forward, let's look at some of the other things that I like about the Aperture Storm 1000C. The first one is noticeable as soon as you open the case for the first time. Both the header and power cables come properly coiled, finally! Everybody rejoice! We no longer need to let them bake in the sun or sit in hot water to untwist them and get them to a usable state. Speaking of the case, the handles on the top now feature two rivets instead of one on each side. I'm happy to see this small upgrade. I think I've pretty much pulled the handle through the rivets on every single one of my aperture cases at this point. So hopefully this little addition will increase longevity. And the padding and plastic handle on this case feel slightly thicker than their previous cases as well. So I'll consider that an upgrade too. And while I don't have the new Fresnel yet, rumor has it that it's going to fit nicely inside here somehow. Another small quality of life improvement, Aperture has added angle indicators to the yoke. Not necessarily the biggest thing, 
but being able to know the approximate angle this light was placed at will make replicating looks easier when scenes need to match. The header cable features new connectors that are much easier to use than the ones found on older generations. And the click lock on the ballast end and the twist to engage lock on the head unit are also much more obvious when the lock mechanism has been engaged. I also love Aperture's new locking Bowens mount. Not only is it way easier to use than the press to release mounting style found on every other light, but it also helps align optical modifiers more precisely with the cob. We can see this approach in how the new 45 degree Bowens mount modifier has a beveled edge on the inside so that it fits seamlessly with the cob. I am very excited to see what this means once I get my hands on the new CF12 for now. This next feature is a big one for me. I've been arguing for LED lights to have some version of this new HSIC Plus mode for years now, so I'm beyond stoked to see this finally get included. HSIC Plus is an advanced version of HSI mode, basically combining CCT and HSI modes into one. Normally, HSI mode only allows the user to manipulate the hue, saturation, and intensity level of a light, hence the name. And because HSI mode doesn't allow any form of CCT control, lights will desaturate to a white point that's been predetermined by the manufacturer. But in this new HSI-C Plus mode, users can dial in any color temperature they'd like with full green magenta control, like 1800 Kelvin minus 100% green, for instance, and then desaturate any color to the dialed in white point. Of course, I tested this, and I've got a graphic for you later on that makes it much easier to visualize what I'm talking about. Also, I'm glad to see the inclusion of an operation status and error log screens. Operation status throws the temperatures of the LEDs and LED MCU, which will come in handy running this unit in the hot Colorado sun. And I'm hopeful that the error log screen could be used to speed up or negate the repair process altogether since parts could potentially be pre-ordered before the unit is even shipped back, and especially if we're able to diagnose things that we can replace ourselves like faulty cables. Finally, as beefy as the new case is, I can't wait to get my hands on the new skid plate for this light. I always use my 600 series units with the F10 Fresnel, so having the CF12 Fresnel and header cable already attached to the 1000C head will make storage convenient and save time deploying this light on set. While the Aperture Storm 1000C has a lot of things to love about it, that doesn't mean there aren't a few things that I'd adjust to make the user experience even better. One of the bigger issues that I have with this unit is probably because I have a pre-production prototype, but there is an electrical hum at a high frequency emanating from the ballast when I have the unit operating in certain intensity ranges. It's audible from up to four feet away, so I pretty much just need to remember to keep it that distance from the sound guy's boom. To improve the user experience, Aperture could make the green magenta indicator turn green or magenta once we dial the value towards either of those directions. This small change would make it more intuitive to use this light for people who haven't memorized that plus 100% means green and one minus 100% means magenta, as it can be hard to tell which direction the light is headed until a minimum threshold has been reached, even when looking directly at the light output. I also would like to see an icon indicator for whether the light is in maximum or constant output mode. There's a space up there. Come on, just make me one real quick. The rubber, plastic, whatever on the tips of the locking Bowens mount handles is like slightly squishy and feels like it could wear down with time or just kind of tear altogether with enough force, leaving some bare metal behind. I've been reassured that we're going to be able to replace these as necessary, but I still wish this was just a piece of machined metal instead. Last, I wish a button existed that would allow us to quickly toggle presets of whatever option is selected. Sort of like how the old daylight only models would adjust by 20% intensity increments when the knob was clicked in. I'd love it if we could just press some button to toggle intensities, color temperature, hue values, saturation, whatever. And while I'm spitballing here, 
maybe even add a second button so that I can A-B test the light without using the power button because I just don't like doing that. I find that rotating the knob to fine tune so many variables is a little time consuming sometimes, even if it does look clean. With so much new tech under the hood of the Aperture Storm 1000C, I had a lot of questions that I wanted to answer. Some of these questions included, how accurate is the Storm 1000C in CIE daylight mode? And certainly not least, am I clinically insane? Anyway, let's hop into what's clearly my favorite part of every light review, the data discussion section. As always, a link to all of these graphs is provided in the description so you can evaluate the data yourself. For every test in this section, I changed values on the ballast, used the included 45 degree reflector, and metered at a distance of five feet from the cob with my Siconic C800. I made sure the C800 read under before the Storm 1000C was turned on and any readings were taken to ensure that only light emitted from the unit itself was metered. XY values were transformed to UV values so that the data can be displayed in the CIE 1976 color space, which was chosen for its perceptual uniformity. And one final reminder that none of these tests are able to account for the fluorescence effect of the indigo emitter either. It is just the zhuzh that makes this light what it is. This first part covers how well the Aperture Storm 1000C is able to track the respective white light standards, CIE daylight, and black body. Before we dive into the results though, I want to cover the basic diagram template that I'll be overlaying the data onto. The TM30 color temperature reference line, which incorporates the previously mentioned CIE daylight shift from 4000 Kelvin to 5000 Kelvin, is graphed in gray. Lines above and below indicate 1 8th and 1 quarter strength co color correction gels of green and magenta respectively. Color temperature increments are color coded and have been marked with cross hatches that indicate where that, teller, where that color temperature is on each standard line. An important thing to note is that each of the dots in these five lines is separated by a value of one just noticeable difference from the next. Just noticeable difference, or JND, is a theory in psychology describing the amount that a stimulus must change for it to be perceived by 50% of the population. Using J and D in this diagram, combined with highlighting select CCT values in the resulting data, makes it easy to infer how much warmer or cooler a light will appear to us than it should be. I do want to note that values are only separated by J and D on the same line and not between lines. In other words, 1 8th green and the reference standard are separated by more than one J and D value from each other. I'll explain just noticeable difference again with a few examples because I do think that this is a really useful tool that connects numbers on a graph to our perception. All right, now that all that is out of the way, just how accurate is the Aperture Storm 1000C anyway? Let's start by testing it at 100% intensity from 2700 Kelvin to 7000 Kelvin in 100 Kelvin increments in CCT mode and with the CIE daylight option selected. Graphing the resulting UV values shows us how closely this light follows the TM30 reference standard. As we can see, the 1000C metered close to a 16th-ish green color correction gel along the entire curve, a deviation which is barely noticeable, if at all, from the standard. The highlighted CCT points tell us that at 100% intensity, the 1000C measures slightly cooler than expected below values of 5000 Kelvin and slightly warmer above this point. Which brings us back to this just noticeable difference thing. If we look at the 2700 mark, we can see that it's slightly cooler than where it should be, but it has still only moved a distance of less than one dot 
or one JND value to the left. So while the light measures cooler than 2700 Kelvin, most of us wouldn't be able to detect this difference with our eye, and therefore by extension, we won't be able to detect this difference after it's been captured with our cameras either. When we look at the other end of the graph, although the 7000 Kelvin CCT value comes in warmer than expected, this 125 Kelvin difference is only just over the 2 JND threshold, meaning that it only barely appears warmer than it should. We can see this color temperature trend a little easier when the expected versus measured CCT values are graphed in direct relation to one another. Notice that just like in the UV plot, the measured lines in this graph also trends visibly lower than the ideal line beginning around 5000 Kelvin. I also wanted to see if changing the intensity had an effect on how well the 1000C tracked the TM30 standard, so I also measured the light at 75% intensity, 50% intensity, and 25% intensity. What's crazy to me is that 100% intensity was already well beyond acceptable, and this light actually gets more true to the reference line as intensity is reduced instead of getting more variable. This is also apparent when the expected versus measured CCT values are graphed at each intensity. This is not expected at all, since basically every light I've ever tested trends the opposite way. This is a very impressive result here and at every intensity. And I know that this data only represents the color temperature range from 2700 Kelvin to 7000 Kelvin, so I also tested the accuracy of the unit at 100% intensity across the entire CCT range from 1800 Kelvin all the way to 20,000 Kelvin. There's two takeaways from this diagram. First, this light is actually crazy accurate across the entire CCT range. From 1800 Kelvin all the way to 20,000 Kelvin, the light is less than 2 JND away from the ideal color temperature and less than 1 8th green color correction away from ideal everywhere as well. Second, notice how large the distance is between 1800 Kelvin and 2700 Kelvin when compared to the gap between 10,000 Kelvin and 20,000 Kelvin. Because this data is presented in a perceptually uniform color space, these two distances show how much easier it is for the human eye to detect small Kelvin changes at the lower end of the color temperature scale, which is why I will continue to argue that there's a real need for greater fidelity on our lights than Kelvin increments of 50 and especially 100 at the lower end of the color temperature scale. As users, we are jumping two, three, and sometimes even four values of just noticeable difference each time we shift by 50 Kelvin at the warm end, which means that there are gradations in color temperature that just aren't even available to us currently because of this limitation. All right, let's swap out of CIE daylight and into black body mode so we can see what effect this change has on the output of the Storm 1000C. When the resulting data is plotted, we can see that at 100% intensity, the black body curve moves from about a 16th-ish green color correction towards a 16th-ish magenta color correction, starting at 4000 Kelvin. An expected result, as black body mode follows the older Planckian curve standard, which is magenta shifted compared to CIE daylight. The magenta shift that occurs starting at 4000 Kelvin in the Planckian curve relative to the CIE daylight one becomes readily apparent when I flop between the two diagrams. Similar to CIE daylight, there's also a slight cooling to the measured CCT values below 5000 Kelvin and warmer above this threshold. Again, this trend becomes more obvious when the expected versus measured CCT values are compared to one another directly. Also similar to the CIE daylight result, the 1000C does a great job remaining consistent as intensity is reduced to 75%, to 50%, and then down to 25%. Another thing I was curious to find out is how consistently the Aperture Storm 1000C stays at both the 5600 Kelvin and 3200 Kelvin reference color temperatures 
as intensity is adjusted. And since I'm taking readings at 5% intensity increments, I might as well grab some lux measurements so we can see how accurately the light doubles in output as intensity is doubled with each white light standard selected. First, I tested the light in CCT mode with the CIE daylight option selected and in 5% intensity increments. The resulting graph indicates that this light is remarkably consistent throughout the entire tested intensity range. I'd like to bring us back to the concept of just noticeable difference because it really helps us connect the results of this graph to how we will perceive the differences in color temperature. Each of the values on the y-axis on the left are separated by a value of 1 JND. So a distance of 2 to 3 JND in either direction would be considered acceptable. 3 to 5 starts to get ugly, I mean, anything at 6 and above I would personally consider to be a total mismatch. So the Storm 1000C staying well within one just noticeable difference of the 5600 Kelvin target from 100% down to 5% intensity is a phenomenal result. As for the y-axis on the right, the UV helps tell us how far a point lies from the Planckian curve, which means that DUV is a reference for black body and not CIE daylight. As a result, CIE daylight actually appears roughly around a measurement of 0.003, which is why this graph is labeled how it is there. So, despite DUV not measuring near zero, this is actually an expected result, and the value, while slightly over the standard, is about where it should be. And this correlates with the previously shown UV color temperature plot, where the 5600 Kelvin point graphs slightly greener than the standard. Isn't it great when data agrees with itself? At 3200 Kelvin, there is slightly less consistency to the measurements at intensity levels below 30%, but not enough for me to worry at all. Remember, we're still in that 1 to 2 J and D range here, so this variation is still well within spec. The DUV target at 3200 Kelvin is zero in CIE daylight mode because both white light standards reference the Planckian curve below 4000 Kelvin. This result shows us that the light is slightly green shifted compared to the target, which is again visible if we refer back to where the 3200 Kelvin measurement lies on our chromaticity diagram. And when we look at the corresponding lux values for both 5600 Kelvin and 3200 Kelvin, we can see that this light is remarkably linear and it's dimming in CCT mode with CIE daylight selected. An R squared value of 1.0 implies perfectly linear correlation, so a result of 0.9999 is basically perfect. And when we look at the hard numbers on the left side, the light also loses one stop of output every time the intensity is cut in half anywhere along the range. What's interesting to me is that with this new chipset, 3200 Kelvin measures slightly brighter than 5600 Kelvin. And we'll see this result again and again. This isn't an outlier. And now, the question that I know a lot of you have been waiting for. Here's how the Storm 1000C compares an output to the 1200D. It's over 10,000 lux brighter at max output. And if we swap from CIE daylight to black body, do we see any differences? Well, clearly there's a bit of an outlier point at 10% intensity, and I did verify that one a few times. Otherwise, the only difference is that DUV measures closer to the zero target, which is where it should be since DUV is a measurement of how far a chromaticity value is from the Planckian curve, which is what black body references. At 3200 Kelvin, the light appears remarkably similar to the CIE daylight results, which is great since technically Aperture didn't have to implement any new math here because CIE daylight and black body have the same targets below 4000 Kelvin. The corresponding lux values for both 5600 Kelvin and 3200 Kelvin are also effectively the same as when CIE daylight is selected. Another comparison that I wanted to make was to see how accurate the CCT output is in HSIC plus mode. This is because I'd ideally love to work in only HSIC mode, 
since it gives us access to the entire option of CCT and color possibilities. But I don't want to sacrifice color temperature accuracy to do so. So first, let's look at how well the light followed the TM30 reference curve with CIE Daylight chosen. In HSI C mode and at 100% intensity, the Storm 1000C meters remarkably similar to how it metered in CCT mode, which is exactly the result that I was hoping to see. As we start to decrease the intensity, we can see that the resulting curve becomes a little more jittery, while definitely appearing less consistent, the 1000C actually does a better job at tracking the TM30 reference standard at 25% intensity than at 100%, just like in CCT mode. And despite the color temperature readings becoming more erratic as intensity is lowered, as we can see here in these graphs of expected versus measured CCT and HSIC mode, that shift is never more than two values of J and D away from the target color temperature as indicated on the UV plot by the highlighted data points. And when we switch to black body mode, we get a fairly similar result across all of the tested intensities. Here's how the data looks at 75%, 50%, and 25% as well. One thing that's interesting to me about this particular data set is how the values above 5000 Kelvin get slightly cooler than their intended targets as intensity is reduced. Only in HSI C mode with black body standard did I see this result, so I'm not sure why that happened. And to really get a picture of how well the Storm 1000C performed at outputting color temperature in HSI C mode, I also tested how accurately it maintained both 5600 Kelvin and 3200 Kelvin as intensity was adjusted from 100% to 5% using both CIE Daylight and black body standards. First, CIE Daylight. Obviously, there's this weird point at 15%, which I've validated multiple times, but otherwise, the 1000C stays well within one just noticeable difference of the intended target throughout the entire intensity range and DUV measures about where it did in CCT mode as well. And as for the LUX measurements, we see remarkable linearity and consistency with the prior measured values in CCT mode. Flipping over to black body, and this is where we see why I might hesitate to use the light in HSIC mode when I've got black body selected. We can see that while Storm 1000C stays within 1 J and D at intensity levels above 60%, it trends near 3 J and D at 15% and all the way above 5 at 10%. And similarly at 10%, the DUV, shout, DUV value shifts to nearly a eighth color correction of magenta, which is a very noticeable difference. When measured at 3200 Kelvin, the light comes back to reality and shows a very similar result as black body in CCT mode. The corresponding LUX measurements at each intensity in black body mode were still very linear though and lined up rather well with the output in CCT mode. Time to take a peek at how good the low level dimming performance of this light really is. I tested the Storm 1000C in CCT mode with both CIE Daylight and Black Body White Light standards selected from 5% down to 0.1% intensity in 0.1% increments. First up, let's look at how CIE Daylight measured at 5600 Kelvin. Now, this result does look more jittery than previous graphs, but there's also 50 data points as compared to the prior 20, so that's kind of the main reason. Otherwise, this is a ridiculously impressive result. To be this accurate all the way down to 0.1% intensity is wild. I've never tested a light that can do this. And the result is the same for 3200 Kelvin as well. Just incredibly astonishing stuff from the team at Aperture here. And as for the output in Lux, here's how that looks. Near perfect linearity, and twofold reduction with a cut in half of intensity 
with the only blip being that 0.2% and 0.1% had the same lux measurement for both color temperatures, which I did verify multiple times. But to go from 60,000 lux to just 250 lux, which is a difference of eight stops, while retaining color accuracy this well, Aperture wasn't lying about this low level intensity stuff. For reference, a light that maintained perfect linearity down to 0.1% intensity would have about nine and a half stops of dynamic range. And most current LED lights have about five to six. So if Aperture releases a firmware update that solves this 0.1 and 0.2 intensity blip, then the Storm 1000C would be at a nearly perfect nine stops of dynamic range. And here's how the 1200D looks at the low end for comparison, since I know some of you in the comments are gonna ask. These lights aren't even in the same ballpark. I'm not even sure they're playing the same game anymore. This impressive dimming performance is essentially the same when we switch over to black body mode. It gets a little out of sorts here at 0.2 and 0.1% intensity as well, but otherwise, that accuracy is ridiculous. And it's the same story for the 3200 Kelvin readings in this intensity range. And lastly, the Lux readings for both 5600 Kelvin and 3200 Kelvin from 5% to 0.1% intensity were pretty much the same as in CIE daylight mode. Occasionally, us operators will be asked to cue CCT sweeps, such as a moon to day time lapse scene or enhance some thematic element in the story. And this is where knowing that constant output mode actually works will come in handy. As we can see in this graph, there is a large difference in the measured lux values across the entire color temperature range when using the Storm 1000C in maximum output mode. What this means practically is that if we do a color temperature sweep from say 5600 to 10,000 Kelvin, because we want to cool the scene off a little, we will lose half a stop of light while doing so. And this will become even greater if we want our cue to go cooler than 10,000 Kelvin or warmer than 3200 Kelvin. To keep our exposure consistent, we can switch the 1000C over to constant output mode which should keep the output the same between 2000 Kelvin and 10,000 Kelvin. We do lose some output compared to max output mode, as expected, but the resulting graph is remarkably flat. Any deviation here is impossible to detect, and so that's great to see. That constant output mode is working as expected. And if I'm going to be queuing a color temperature sweep in constant output mode, I do want to make sure that this light is as accurate as it is in maximum output mode. So naturally, I tested the 1000C at 100% intensity across the entire com color temperature range in CCT mode. The resulting plot continues to confirm that this light is amazingly color accurate in pretty much any mode and with any option chosen. And when I tested how well the light stayed at 5600 Kelvin, and 3200 Kelvin in both CIE daylight and black body modes, the light scored remarkably similar to max output mode. Here's the 5600 Kelvin result for CIE daylight in constant output mode and how that compared to max output mode. And the 3200 Kelvin result for CIE daylight in constant output mode and in max output mode. And here's the 5600 Kelvin result in constant mode for black body compared to max output mode. And lastly, here's 3200 Kelvin in constant output mode with black body selected compared to, oh wow, max output mode. All right, I hear you now. Enough with the color temperature testing. This is a color light. So where's the color data? So let's see how well the new Aperture Storm 1000C does at outputting color, considering the claim of 90% Rec 2020 coverage. I metered the output in HSIC plus mode in five degree hue increments at an intensity level and saturation level of 100%. When these chromaticity values are plotted, 
The resulting graph shows us the gamut coverage of the 1000C in HSIC Plus mode. And when I plot the REC 2020 triangle over this data, I'm pretty sure that Aperture wasn't lying about that 90% coverage. It looks like there's a slight amount of deep blue coverage missing, some deep greens as well, and a little more gone in the way of reds. One other result that I'd like to point out on this graph is that I do wish there was a little more fidelity between the cyan and blue region, as we can see the dots are spaced a little further apart here than anywhere else on the graph. Hopefully this can be addressed in a future firmware update or something. Next, let's take a look at an area that I was really hoping to see the Storm 1000C improve in from prior models. I really wanted a more linear relationship between the saturation knob and color output than we've had in previous generations. So, I tested the 1000C in 30 degree hue increments and at saturation levels of 100%, 75, 50, and 25%. And boy, did Aperture improve here. These results are incredible. The spacing remains consistent across every measured hue and saturation level, and each hue perfectly desaturates towards the chosen white point. And even when the intensity is lowered from 100% to 75%, and 50%, and 25%, there isn't much change at all to this result. And we can see how accurate the light stays as intensity is adjusted if I graph this data set by saturation levels instead of intensity. When viewed this way, the tight groupings for each hue become obvious, as there's barely any spread within each of the hues and across all of the measured saturation levels. Another thing I was curious about was whether changing from CIE daylight to black body would be noticeable in either the hue spread or the desaturation graphs. While the chromaticity values at 100% saturation remain basically the same, which is expected since CCT and green magenta adjustment should only start to affect the color output at levels below 100% saturation, we do see a change in the measured values as saturation is reduced, even at just 75% saturation, and the white point is noticeably shifted. And to really push the limits of how well the Storm 1000C is able to desaturate to a given white point, I tested it set to a white point of 20,000 Kelvin and 100% green, as well as at 1800 Kelvin and minus 100% magenta and I could flip between these two graphs all day. This result just looks so cool to me. So, the Aperture Storm 1000C works pretty well in HSIC mode, but how about its accuracy in XY mode? To test that, we will need some standard values, and I just happen to have some if we swap back to testing CCT values, so let's do that. This diagram indicates that the light is just as color accurate when inputting CCT values in XY mode as it is in CCT mode with pre-selected CCT values. In the Storm 1000C, even trends slightly green, just like in CCT mode. And if anyone has a better way to figure out the accuracy in XY mode, drop a comment, because I'm all ears on this one. But what I'm really curious about is this photo on the ballast when selecting XY mode. Because to me, this looks like XY offers the user a wider gamut than HSIC mode. So I metered a few points along the bounds of the XY color gamut and plotted that in the same color space. And when we swap between the XY mode and the HSIC mode graphs, we can see that there's clearly a larger gamut enabled by XY mode. But is this extra color space actually useful? When I plot the REC 2020 color space over the XY gamut, we can see that while this section is visible to our eyes, we aren't actually able to replicate those colors using most standard display devices. So while this extra gamut is useful in helping the Storm 1000C achieve that 90% REC 2020 coverage, 
these other colors aren't values that I'll be dialing in on a film set anytime soon. Lastly, I plugged in a few values to check the gamut in RGB mode because I've gone this far, so why not? Looks the same as HSIC plus mode to me. Does this review make me sound like one giant fanboy for the Aperture Storm 1000C? Maybe, but I really do believe that this is the next leap forward for filmmaking. And the inclusion of the Indigo emitter in the Blair GC chipset is going to mark the death of the almighty HMI lamp. Don't believe me? Go get your own 1000C and find out for yourself how amazing this light is. If you've made it this far, maybe give this video a like and toss me a sub so I can continue to give you reviews that go this in depth. And if you're ever in the Denver area and you find yourself in need of a gaffer, make sure to reach out. You can find me and what's in my one ton grip and electric package right here. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.